Hey, hey, hey. How's everybody doing on this Sunday? Hey, Cass. Hey, Heath. Cass, I thought you weren't coming today. So I was working on the white balance a little bit on my camera in the autofocus. So I think this is better than before. Um, I think it looks a little closer to what she looks like in real life. Um, so you can see the skin tone that we've been working on the last couple sessions, where we ended it at. You can see the nice transitions into the shadows highlighted areas. Um, you might notice that her face seems to be just a little bit lighter than the other skin tone. Um, that's slightly intentional. Um, nice. Oh, so I'm, uh, I'm competing with Josh today. <laughs> that's no good. Um, but generally speaking, one of the things that you can do with miniatures as you start to be intentional about the way that you do your shadows and highlights um, is you want to control the you want to control the viewer, like where his eyes, his or her eyes go when they look at your miniatures. Um, and you want to create focal points. So if you just put like equal shadows and highlights everywhere all over your model um, and you don't you don't have a good balance of where there's light places where there's dark places um, it just kind of is a visual even if everything's done technically well it creates kind of a visual mess um, the the person looking at the model doesn't really know where to rest their eyes and it's not a conscious thing it's a it's a subconscious thing but it's just it starts to look very busy there, there's no place for them to focus on so what you want to do is create some natural focal points. Um, a natural place that humans tend to, to look at are faces. So if you can give them extra reason to sort of draw their attention to the face of the model, that's a good like place to kind of draw them into your model um, and a good place visually to start. So one way you can help to do that is to make the, the face just a little bit lighter than the rest of the, the skin tone. So it just kind of creates a nice natural spot for the, the viewer's eyes to land when they first look at your model. Um, so today, ex exactly. Um, so today what I was going to start with is I was going to start with um, doing the eyes. And before I do the eyes on Allie, I'm going to do the eyes on a different miniature because I'm going to show you a different technique. These Malifaux models are really, really tiny, but they can serve a purpose. Uh, I had intended to do one of them, but they have really, really tiny faces. So let me, let me see if I can grab a model real fast from over here that might be better. So I've got this Eisenhorn model from the 40, from the Warhammer Inquisitor game that came out a long time ago. Um, he's a little bit better, although his eyes are really recessed and kind of squinty too, but it'll, you'll get the idea. So this is the sort of, I would say, the easy way to create convincing eyes. Um, and that is to paint the eyes before you paint anything else. And if you remember me talking about last, on the last session, that the downside of doing this is that you got to be really, really careful when you paint the rest of the face because um, your paint is going to want to just sink right into those eye sockets. 
Um, so you got to be a little careful when you're painting the rest of the face where you don't have to have that same level of care if you do the eyes later, but then the eyes themselves are harder to paint. So you just take some white paint. I didn't even thin it at all. I don't need too much on my brush. And I'm just going to glob the white paint into the eye socket. And I'm purposely showing you that it doesn't even matter how messy you get. That is not a very clean way to fill the the uh, whites of the eyes. But it's okay. You just got to fill that in with white. Give it a second to dry. Cool. No, it's not plastic limnin. It's uh it's just primed gray. But yeah, this is Eisenhorn. Um I I bought him when the game first came out. I've never played the game, but I bought him when the game first came out. And uh, I've loved this model and wanted to paint it for years, but it's just one of those things that's never really made it to the top of the queue. Um, a couple months ago, I actually went ahead and assembled him and primed him. And then again, that's as far as he's got. He was always, he's always a little intimidating simply just because I really wanted to I really want to go super nuts on this cloak. You know, huge, beautifully detailed Inquisition symbol here, all sorts of filigree all along the edge of the cloak, things like that. So I kind of wanted to wait until I felt like I had practiced the style of the freehand that I want to do on him enough. Um, yeah. So in fact, let me show you, I think I, I did it last, the very beginning of last room. I don't even know if anybody was on yet, but. Um, like for example, I was practicing filigree using this banner. And so this is the kind of design that I, I want to do along the edge of the cloak. So I was just practicing some different designs along the edge of, you can see it's not very symmetric. I was just trying all sorts of different things around the banner. And uh, so I want to do some of that. I was practicing. I'm going to be painting some Redemptor Dreadnoughts, uh, one of them for a client and then one of them to donate to a charity raffle. And uh, at least one of those two is going to be a Death Watch one. So he's going to have Inquisition symbols all over him. So I'll practice the Inquisition stuff that I want to eventually put on the back of his cloak with that. But I really want this guy to be amazing when I work on him, so I'm putting him off, off a little bit. Are you guys freaking out on the, uh, the filigree, or was there something else? I, it's kind of funny. I was I meant to finish the model at some point. Um, I mean, you can see I started, you know, working down here, but he's kind of chunky and blocky, and so there wasn't a lot that was getting me super excited about the rest of the miniature. I mean, the banner is huge and impressive and really cool. And then when I was practicing on the back of the banner, I'm going to cover this up for a second. Um, I was trying to do this really subtle like patterning. And then because these guys are um, like a lion, like lion is their symbol. I was like, let me freehand this like cross with a lion face. And this turned out so terribly that it just killed any desire for me to actually finish this model. Um, I don't know, one day I might go in and get rid of all of this. I can uh, paint on some basically nail polish remover or something and just get this paint off of there and just maybe fix all this area up again, but that just uh, killed my enthusiasm for <laughs> for finishing this model. But it was good practice for the filigree. <clears throat> all right, so back to this guy with the eyes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of decide how he's looking. And this guy looks like he's 
you know, facing something that's just head on to him. You know, he's just pulled his sword out of the scabbard. He looks like he's ready to tackle somebody coming head on to him. So I'm going to paint the, the pupils looking directly ahead. So I'm going to go right in the middle of each eye. I'm not going to put a dot. I'm actually going to put a bar, like a vertical bar, right through the middle. And I don't even care if I get on the rest of the face. I'm just going to paint some vertical bars. Again, you can see I'm not even worrying about being super clean. Now I'm going to go back. And this is the, the part where you actually have to be a little careful. I'm going to outline the eye. But because I haven't painted the face yet, I can, I can move my brush away from the eye. And so therefore I can keep the line nice and straight without, um, without going into the eye. So I'm, I'm lining it, but I'm purposely pulling my brush away from the eyeball to help keep me from getting black down into the... into the eye socket. I didn't finish my sentence. Now you don't have to use black for this. You can use a really dark red if you want, um, but black works too. Black creates more uh, contrast and more drama. The red probably makes it look a little more realistic. All right, so you've got some eyes. And then what you would do is essentially just take your, whatever base coat you're gonna use for the skin. Thanks for stopping by, Cass. I'm gonna wait for the black to finish drying. So take the base coat and just go right up to where you where the eye starts, leaving just the tiniest bit of black around the eye. And I'll stop there, but you would then just paint the rest of the head with the flesh tone. But you get really, really nice looking eyes. You'll have people, all sorts of people ask you how in the world you painted the eyes so well. How do you like get in there? You know, all this kind of stuff. And really, honestly, you're sort of cheating the whole way. Um, 
because you're not really painting the eye with your brush. You're sort of just always painting sort of the negative space um, where you don't want the eye. So I would say that this is how I painted eyes for years. Um, I won Golden Demon painting competitions with miniatures where the eyes were painted this way. Um, different Master Craftsman awards. I painted eyes like this for a long time and everyone was always impressed. But it's super easy to do it that way. Um, like I said, the trick is it's really difficult as you paint the face to do like washes and glazes and other things on the face because all of that stuff wants to run down into the eye socket. And so you have to keep the eye sockets clear of all of that paint. No, I don't usually paint under magnifying glass. I do have one attached to this light, and I probably could get better with it if I practice, but I tried a couple times to paint under a magnifying glass, and two things kind of bugged me about it, um, or were really hard for me. And one is that the magnifying glass, while it makes everything bigger, it sort of distorts your depth perception. And I would find that the brush, even though I could see the brush going in, you know, the amount that I would move my hand and how far the brush would go was not exactly what like my brain um, normally coordinated because it's so used to just seeing things up, you know, in my hand. And so the, whatever distance I moved the brush to do all my things, all the, all the depth was off. So I would hit the model before I expected to, paint would glob, all sorts of stuff. Um, the other thing that is, is tough is you'll notice how many times like I dip my brush in the paint and clean the brush and do all this stuff. So, you know, I'm looking at the model, but I'm also doing all sorts of stuff on the side constantly. And going from underneath the, the magnifying glass to then not looking under the magnifying glass every few seconds just was like way super wonky for, for my eyes and, and it would give me a headache really quickly. So. Um, it was very difficult. Now, I fully expect as I get older, um, there might be one day where I just can't avoid it anymore and I have to start painting under a magnifying glass and I'll have to figure out how to make all that work. But that's for the future. But anyway, so that's the simple way to paint really nice looking eyes. I suggest that beginners, um, when you're first painting models, um, use that technique to start with because it still takes some brush control, it still takes some practice, but it's way easier than painting the eyes after the fact. Um, you don't need nearly the same steady hand or um, paint, you know, control of the paint consistency and things like that to do that. So I recommend that quite a bit. Uh, give me one second. Last night, um, or not last night, but yesterday afternoon, I, my brother-in-law and a couple other people were over here. We were playing some games. I had to clear off all my painting stuff because this is also our dining room table. And uh, I had left all the paints that I was using. I forgot to bring them over when I was resetting everything up. All right, I noticed one real quick thing before I do the, the eyes on Allie. Is I had done her eyebrows. you can see them. Uh, I had done her eyebrows. However, the, the eyebrow above her right eye doesn't go quite far, quite as far in towards her nose as the other side does. And so I'm going to fix that real quick. more even. All 
All right, so since I did that other eye with black, I'm gonna do this one with a really dark red instead. Well, it, it can crystal, by the way, hello, I'm glad you're here. Um, I can zoom it in a bit, my, my struggle with that, and we can try this. Um, my struggle is going to be keeping the miniature under the camera. Is that better? And that, you know, this is not like the, the most expensive camera in the world, so it's, its ability to focus is, is a little uh, not, not uh, perfect, but is that better? Yeah, okay. So I wish I could hear you guys. Like I wish there was a little buzzer you could uh, set off if I start drifting out of the, out of the camera range, but um, I'll try to keep her in camera here. The other reason I was more zoomed out was because it's easier to see my palette. So this, this red is pretty nice, but I want it to be a little darker. I'm going to add just a touch of black to it. Here, since, since my camera is zoomed in, let me also show you the the Eisenhorn, those eyes that I did earlier under the zoomed in. Yeah, you, you can, I turned off the autofocus so I could control the depth of focus. I assume that's what you're talking about, Mr. Uh, Heath. But like each click of the, of the focus um, sort of jumps a larger distance and so like it, it's kind of hard to zero it into exactly where the miniatures are um, and how I would hold them under here. So anyway, so there's what the eyes look like. Just the quick, simple. I mean, you guys watched me do the whole thing. It probably took longer waiting for them to dry than to actually um, paint the whole thing. And they're pretty convincing. There's a definite white space. There's definite pupils. Um, if you're feeling really adventurous, you could go black, back in with a really fine tip point, put a tiny, tiny, just little dot of white right along uh, the black to kind of give some of that reflection, make them look even more realistic, but super, super quick and easy. Looks great. All right, so now with Allie, I am going to color in the entirety of the inside part of her eyes. I don't want to paint any of the eyelids. I just want to paint what would essentially be the whites of her eyes, which is kind of odd, you might think, because I'm not using white. I'm using a dark color. But this, is a, this is kind of like the black line around the eyes is how it's going to function. And I already messed up a little bit.
All right, so I did the left side of each eye because that angle was better. I'm going to flip her around. So she looks almost a little demonic now. She's got some dark red into her eyes. Um, I need to do those lips too. I'll do those later. Now, we, now comes the white. Now, I need this white to cover up the color underneath it. So I'm not going to thin it down like I normally do for paints. I'm going to keep this a little thicker. However, I noticed I need to go in just a little further towards the inner corner of her eye. So I, I do notice that some um, really good lighting helps a lot to, to reduce the, the eye fatigue. Um, it's certainly something I struggle with more as I've gotten older. Um, like I'll notice after a few hours of painting, like my eyes sort of go buggy and they have a harder time changing focus as I move back and forth between things. Um, Handshaking, I, I don't usually have too much of a problem with that myself. Um, holding this, this size model, uh, the wider I hold my hands, the more I sort of get a little bit of hand fatigue and some shake, um, especially when I'm working at the, the extreme end up here, which is really far from the point where she's contacted with the base. So it flexes a little bit as I squeeze, which then causes some uh, just kind of shaking all around. Um, I also probably am worse on a Sunday since right before I paint, I, I usually go rock climbing. That's kind of part of my Sunday routine. And so my, my hands and my forearms are quite fatigued from that. So that makes, that makes the painting on a Sunday always a little trickier. And coughing does it to me too. If I've had coffee too recently before I start painting, I'll notice I have more hand shaking. Now I'm using white paint and I'm going down into the corners trying to leave a little bit of the of the dark red around the edge. Uh, I know that the pupil is a little small at the moment, but I'll fix that later. Um, now you don't have to use, um, you don't have to use white. Some people think that the white is a little bright to use in the whites of eyes because you know, eyes aren't really like stark white. They're just slightly white, off-white usually. So you can use a, a near white for this, and some people really prefer that.
I don't personally find it makes much difference to me. Um, I usually can't tell. There's just such such little amount of paint on the model. <laughs> I like these in between uh, moments. Sometimes she looks a little crazy, like she's got like a lazy right eye. But yeah, it's just such it's such a little amount of paint on there that. I don't, I don't personally think it makes much difference, but there are some people that swear that you should not use white paint when you're painting eyes, but use something close instead. Now, from here, you'll, I don't know if you can see, um, her right eye, the white, is a little bit larger than on her left because I, I went over the line just a, a tad, so I'm going to have to go back up and touch, touch up that eye a bit. I'm going to wait till the very end on that because when I do the pupils, it's possible I might mess, do a little something to mess them up too, and I need to clean up that edge as well. Uh, now, you can just use black and go into the spot between the white and just apply some of the black. Um, and just make the eyes black, if that works. Uh, make sure that you don't just put a dot of black to where like you see the round top and the round bottom. You know, if you look at a human eye, when, it's, when someone's looking straight at you, for the most part, you know, the eye goes above and below the, the eyelids on the top. You don't really usually see white above and below. So if you just put a dot of black in the middle, it's going to look like the model's got a wide-eyed stare. That might be an effect you're looking for, but usually not, because um, it makes the model look super scared or freaked out or something like that, and that's generally not what you want. Not certainly somebody like this, who's supposed to be super tough, and um, we don't want her looking scared. Right now, you she looks a little scared to me, so we're going to fix that up. I'm going to try to give her some colored eyes. Um, I'm going to have a lot of green on this model because I think I'm going to do camouflage for her stockings. I'm going to do a camo pattern. Probably a white t-shirt and maybe like an army green uh, outer shirt because she's got like a ribbed cotton t-shirt underneath and then she's got this outer shirt. So I'll probably do like an army green for that. Thinking maybe some blue jean shorts. Some denim shorts but um, so I could do green eyes to help tie all that together but I'm also thinking of doing blue I might do the blue just to help the, the face stand out just a little bit So the first thing I need is a nice dark blue, something that, that can actually substitute almost for a, for a black. So I'm going to use deep blue, or actually I didn't grab deep blue, navy blue works too, uh, navy blue from scale color. You're right, blue would play well off the shorts. Generally speaking, when you're picking colors for your model, I think I talked about this on one of my earlier streams, but you wanna, you don't, you, you generally don't want colors to appear on the model just once. Um, you kinda wanna uh, to create almost geometric shapes with your color placements. So thinking about like, like four corners of a rectangle or having a triangle or an inverted triangle and kind of thinking about colors appearing at generally the vertices of those figures. Um, it just creates nice visual balance. If you think about a model, the color scheme almost having a weight, you want it to look like it's a well-balanced 
figure, something that wouldn't fall over, you know, metaphorically speaking. Um, if, for example, I painted her in kind of all dark colors and then gave her like white boots or something, it just, it, you know, it wouldn't look right. There's all this white down here and there's nothing to balance it up on the top. Um, whereas with all of her skin and if I paint the, the shirt like kind of a, um, like a white cotton t-shirt like I'm thinking about, then you kind of see that her skin and the white all sort of form within this rectangle, the, the, um, um, the skin color is kind of like a white and this would be, although it's not the vertices, it's kind of in the middle, but it forms this area of light and then as I go dark here, if it's balanced by dark like up with her hair and with the shoulders of the jacket, you get some, some of that symmetry. Um, and then the white parts, the light part here in the center of the mass is gonna help to draw the, the viewer's attention to that part. But then the dark is gonna really play off everything well. So, um, I've thought about showing like some bad pictures of things like that on the stream, but I would really hate to to grab somebody's model and then have them see this later and think that I'm picking on them. Because that wouldn't, it's not really my intention. I don't want anybody to feel picked on. So we fixed the problem with the uh, super scared stare. Again, her left eye is more like what it should look like. The right eye, I went a little wide with the white, so I have to clean that up. But um, it's looking pretty good. Again, I could stop here. I'm sure it's hard to see on the camera, but there is definitely a little bit of a blue to it. I'm going to go back in with a lighter blue, covering up almost everything that's there. I'm debating how light to go. If I don't go light enough, you won't it won't really pick up. But if I go too light, it could look weird. So we're gonna try this. I wanna do uh, sky blue from scale color. So again, I'm sure they look more blue in person than on the screen, but I think it's looking pretty good. Um, now, I just need the tiniest, tiniest dot of black right in the middle of those for the, for the pupil. So we've got the iris done. 
This will be the pupil. done you'll probably see better when I um, when I, I'll show pictures on Twitter after the end of the stream and you'll probably be able to see everything a little bit better but ideally at this scale we don't want a ton of blue showing because it's just not really realistic I mean this is such a tiny model her eyes shouldn't be screaming blue. It should be almost one of those things that rewards the, the person looking at your model for spending a little extra time you know, looking at it. It should almost be something they either register without realizing they're seeing it or um, you know, something that only upon closer inspection they say like, oh my gosh, did you actually give her blue eyes? And then you can smile and nod and feel super proud. And like, yeah, I did. And then they'll tell you how awesome you are as a painter and then you can uh, feel good about it. All right, I'm going to go back to. So, Crystal, did you see? Did you see the first when I did the Eisenhorn eyes earlier in the stream? Were you here for that, or did you come on later? Okay, so um, when you get a chance, go back and watch the beginning of the stream. Um, it should archive it on my channel because the way that I did the eyes for this guy is the way that I would recommend doing eyes for smaller scale models. Um, so this was a really, really quick and only took a couple minutes, but it gets pretty convincing eyes. Um, and you don't need near the like brush control or worrying about the paint consistency to get great, great results. And you don't have to worry about messing up uh, the skin, the, the face that you might have taken a really long time to paint on a tiny miniature where you just, like it's almost impossible to put the little dots of white and things like that on there. So I would recommend using the, the technique I did on this, this guy, um, for smaller scale miniatures, at least until you get super comfortable in, in progressing. I mean, you'll notice the models I'm working on right now, I've already done the skin and I haven't done the eyes, so I have to go back and do this more like with what I'm doing on Alley here with these tiny scale miniatures, which is quite difficult um, and not the easiest way to do it, but I've never always been known for uh, choosing the easy way out when I paint my miniatures. All right, I'm going to clean up this. I'm going to try to clean up this right eye, and then we're going to give her just those tiny little white dots of reflection on her eyes, which usually kind of just takes it up to 11, so to speak, in terms of the realism of how the eyes look. I got a touch of blue paint. I didn't notice until I flipped her upside down. Um, just above her eye, um, I'll have to go back with some skin tone and just cover that up a little bit. It's not too noticeable when you look at her from above, but from below I can see it.
All right, what do you think? I think her eyes look uh, looking pretty good. They're pretty even on the two sides. Maybe the right eye looks slightly more open, but you know what? It's not terrible because I've seen a lot of people who have that kind of look on their eyes. It's really close. Um, might just fix a little bit towards the inner part of the eye because it's making the, the irises look different size. Still got a little bit of white here. All right. Now let's try to not completely mess up everything we just did. tricky thing in doing this is the paint drying on your brush before it before I can get it onto the model. Just keep trying until we get it right. Fifth time's the charm on this eye. And I need to go back with the dark blue because my first white dot that actually went on there wasn't placed very well. It went right on the edge of the white. I don't have autofocus on, so I have to try to have it focus lower, but there you go. I don't know if you can see the tiny little white dots reflection in her eye. I'd say those are pretty convincing eyes. I'm happy with them. And that's what counts. Yeah, the, the thin paint is kind of tricky sometimes. Um, the again, look, check out my Twitter later when I post um, when I post pictures up. Um, you'll be able to see more how it looks. I let me see if I can get the auto or get the focus to a higher uh, point. Yeah, I can. zoom in like this it's kind of funny um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever experienced this but if you take pictures of your models and you know especially nowadays with the really nice cameras so um, you know even iPhones and things like that thanks crystal um, 
you know, they take such high resolution images and then you put them on people's computer screens that are nowadays huge, like 28 screen high def monitors. And the model ends up being on the screen, maybe as tall as like eight inches or 10 inches or something on the screen. And you think about the fact that the actual model itself might only be an inch and a half or two inches tall. Every tiny little imperfection possible shows up on that screen. It actually makes the, the paint jobs not look quite as well. Like when I'm looking at her in person here, like the eyes look pretty much perfect to me. But then when I show him under the camera like this, her right eye looks kind of wonky compared to her left. Like it looks a little wider. Like it's maybe slightly looking off to the right a little bit more than her left eye. But I mean, the size of her face right now is multiple times the size of her face in real life. So um, it's just kind of funny how that turns out. So I'm, I'm good with where her eyes stand. See if I got the focus back in. Yeah, it should be pretty good for painting. My, the laptop I'm using for this uh, only has two USB ports. Um, and I'm not sure, I have a dock for it, but I'm not sure if running everything through the dock would make it harder for the, um, um, make it harder for the computer to process everything. But if I ran everything through the dock, I could have my, my USB mouse, my remote Bluetooth mouse over by me and I could control those things better. It's a little tough to do from where I'm sitting. Sorry, I just noticed my computer wasn't plugged in and didn't want us to lose our, our power. Crystal, are you by any chance Aurora in a bag from um, Beasts of War, or are you somebody else? No worries, I just, uh, I was talking to her the other day and she lives in Denmark and, uh, well, I'm glad you're here. Anyway, I, she's just a, somebody who lives in Denmark and was talking about really wanting to catch today's stream live, but it's kind of the middle of the night for her. So she was trying to decide if she was going to stay up late or not and come in. So I just was, was curious, but I am super glad that you're here regardless. Now, I'm going to do her lips next. And I, I will often, like for the, the showgirls that I've been painting, I've been using this color for their lips. But those ladies would probably be wearing makeup. And I'm not sure that would apply to Allie, the uh, zombie killer here. I'm not sure that she's super concerned about how she looks going into battle. So I don't know that I want the the red to be that red. So I think I'm gonna tone it down. Hey, it's like you're reading my mind, Heath. So I'm gonna take pink flesh. And I'm gonna do exactly what you said. Now here's a, here's a tip when you are mixing paints. So you'll notice I actually didn't add the skin tone to where I already had the red. Um, and there's a reason for that, is that dark paint goes a lot further than light paint in terms of changing the, the overall color of what you're painting. So if I were to add the, the flesh into the red, 
I might, I'm gonna have to add a lot more flesh to the red and just keep adding and just keep adding until it gets to be what I want. Whereas if I go the other way, I just take a little bit of the red and just keep adding slowly until it gets to be what I want. I'm going to try this and see if this is going to work. And if not, I'll just add some more. I'm just going to put a little bit on. Might need a little bit more red. Well, I'm actually going to, before I go any further, I am going to paint some of this red right onto her because it's fairly dark and I want to put essentially a little shadow in her pursed lips. I don't really want to use black. It's not very Yeah, that, that'll work too. Um, the only reason I'm, I'm not necessarily doing it as a, as a light glazing is that I didn't really have her, her lips um, highlighted ahead of time. I was kind of avoiding painting her lips as I was painting her face. If I had thought about it ahead of time, I would have just highlighted them like everything else and then I could have just glazed over it lightly with a few passes until it got to be the right color. But I wasn't really paying attention to that as I was going, so I didn't have it sort of pre-highlighted. I could go back and do that now, but yeah. I've started down this road, so let's continue. Something else that's happening. You can tell this is live TV, folks, because nothing, not everything is perfect. Um, I actually made this too light or too thin. It's not covering over the the red that I just put on. So I'm gonna first go back over with pink flesh. Just straight pink flesh, and then I'll color that in.
So Heath, why didn't you uh, abandon us too to go watch the live stream of Sneak Attack? Uh, I didn't realize you had to be a, a Patreon. Well, I'm glad you're sticking around with us. try to do a little bit of a reflection on that. I feel like I need to go back up under her nose maybe and sorry I'm just kind of talking to myself. Yeah, I'm I'm happy too. Let me uh I wish there were presets on this focus. So do just a little bit of white um to sort of create a little bit of uh reflection. Um, pretty happy. I there's like this kind of weird tone underneath her nose. It seems like so I might have to go back later and glaze something up under her nose to get rid of a little bit of the pink tone. But I think she's looking pretty good. I'm ready to move on. Let's work on her t-shirt. Um, white is always an interesting color to work on. Because it's tough to shade and highlight white. Um, actually, let me... I'm going to go over to my, my computer for a second. Um, I had an intention to show something during the stream, and I don't know how many people are watching, but I think this is good for, for uh, all of us to think about.
So first off, um, I'm going to show this picture. This has nothing to do with why I came over here, but um, how many? Of, I don't know how many of you guys grew up with uh, Roadrunner and Coyote, but um, this is a Roadrunner who visited us the other day. We have a lot of desert wildlife around our house. This particular Roadrunner was running all over our property and he was looking for lizards, but uh, this is what Roadrunners actually look like. Um, which is a little bit different than the Warner Brothers version, but I got a couple good pictures of him. Uh, I thought I'd show those. Uh, what I really wanted to show this, right? So one of the things that um, I think it's always good to think about is sort of you know where we start as a painter and where we end at um, you know a lot of painters will talk about this i get a lot of people who you know comment on like oh you're so talented and i can never paint like you and things like that um, but i like to show this picture because these are the first miniatures that i ever painted um, this was from a time when I clearly didn't even know what primer was. Um, I didn't own a flesh paint apparently because I was happy to just leave their skin gray or red or whatever it happened to be. Um, this white beard is horrendously terrible. Um, I don't know anyone who would dress like that wizard with, <laughs> with uh, those colors unless maybe he was on Sesame Street or something. Um, so, you know, this is where I started from. And to give you kind of like a reminder of some recent stuff that I've done, um, you know, this was a recent model that I painted in the last several months, um, which is quite a bit different from where I started. But this is a journey of over 20 years to go between the two. And while that sounds a little bit daunting, the important thing when you're, when you're working on your painting is to not try to compare yourself to what other people that you see are doing. Um, because they may, like myself, and I'm not trying to claim I'm the best painter in the world, but you know they might have been doing this for literally decades. And so to think that you know the first couple models that you paint are somehow not good enough because you see what other people are doing, that's just not that's not a healthy mindset. It's you know it's gonna rob you of the enjoyment of the process. Um, so here's another example. These are the showgirls from first edition Malifo. Um, and again, it's important that what you do is you compare yourself to yourself. So you think about where you're at and where you want to go. So at the time I painted these, I, I have to guess this was probably 2013, maybe, maybe 2012. It was somewhere in that range, 2012 to 2014, somewhere in that range. Um, probably on the earlier side of that range. But I painted these... And when I painted them, I was super duper happy about how they came out. Um, I really loved the purple to, to light blue lavender color fade on the girl on the left. Um, you know, the freehand on the stockings, I think, came out pretty well. The, you know, doing some tattoo work on, on the, the girls. Um, even trying to get a little bit of makeup in there. So I was fairly happy. I shouldn't say I was fairly happy. I was quite happy. And in fact, I really loved what I did with the, the wooden bases on these. Um, here's a back view of them. Again, you can see, I, you know, I'm pretty happy with tattoo work. I'm not crazy about how the koi, I was trying to do a koi on the back of uh, Cassandra. But, you know, I didn't really do much highlighting on the sword. The reds were a little dark um, and lifeless, a little pastel -y on some of the colors. But and at the time, I was super duper excited and completely content with what I did. But, you know, I, after a little while and, and looking at them more, I started to realize or think that, you know, the skin tone is not great. There's not a lot of contrast between depths and shadows. Um, you know, some of those reds are a little dark. They don't have nice highlights. Um, but this was kind of my skill at the time. But I was starting to notice things that I wanted to do better. I wanted to learn how to paint reds better so I could get more highlights in them. I wanted to learn how to um, 
paint, how to get my, my tattoos to actually look more normal, not like they're painted on top of a model, but actually look more like they're embedded into the skin. So I started identifying things of my own painting that I wanted to improve and set out looking for ways to actually get better at those things. Um, you know, learning how to do better non-metallic metals on weapons and things like that. So uh, the reason I, I use these models is, so if you've been following me, you've seen more recently that I've painted the second edition Malifaux models. Um, this was from an early, like a work in progress earlier. They're, they've since been finished painting. But um, when you look at these, I, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't say that the, the freehand work is any different than they were on the other models, but I think the tattoos look more realistic because I've learned ways, like I showed on my previous stream, about how to make the tattoos look more realistic. The skin tones are, have more life to them. They have some depth, some color to them. Um, and just overall, um, I think that the stockings here look a little bit more realistic in terms of the color. Um, the reds, I've learned how to highlight and shade reds better to get more vibrant tones. I don't have to have them all be super dark. Um, you know, similarly with the, the greens, I've learned how to, to get, um, you know, to get better shading and highlighting effects with still containing, still maintaining the vibrant colors instead of everything kind of going pastel on me. Um, and so the reason I, I wanted to take a second to show that is to just really, again, reinforce that, you know, when you're watching me paint or you're watching somebody else paint or you're looking at things on Twitter or Facebook or whatever of, you know, the best painters in the world, um, it could be easy to get discouraged. I, I fight it sometimes too when I look at people like Roman Lapat or um, Ben Kometz or those kind of guys, and I look at what they paint, and it, you know, it blows me away. And so I know that that it's it's tough sometimes to struggle against um, feeling a little bit um, like intimidated or dejected by where you're at. But just you know, the best advice I can give people when they're starting out is just keep painting, and when you finish a model. You know, give it some space, but then try to go back to it and reflect and think about, you know, what could, what was it that I'm not as happy as I could be on these? Um, and then seek out ways to improve that part of your painting. And just do that with every single model or every project that you do. And, you know, pretty soon you're going to find that you're, you're much more advanced than maybe you ever thought you could be. Um, and it's also good to take some time every so often to go back and, you know, reflect on your journey. I mean, it's, it's a good, it's good for me to look at these pictures and remind myself where I came from and to look at sort of intermediate steps in the process and think about where I came from and look at where I'm at now and to continue to try to identify ways that, that I can improve and get better myself and just continue to, to practice the hobby and to be happy with my art and enjoy the process. <clears throat> so I just wanted to take a minute to, um, to do that in in today's stream. And now back to our regularly scheduled painting session. Yep, exactly. Let's see what, uh, yeah, show and tell. So that's, yeah, it's again, you know, we all, we all start someplace. Um, you know, you don't really judge an artist by where they came from. You know, most people just look at where they're at now, but you got to think that we're all growing, we're all pushing, we're all learning all the time. And uh, that's, the, that's the enjoyable thing. At least I find that's the enjoyable thing. And it's, if that's what you focus on, if you focus on the process and enjoying what you're doing and learning how to grow, you're going to get a lot more joy out of your painting than if you're constantly focused about you know, whether you're as good of a painter as somebody else. All right, so let's work on her white shirt. Um, ideally what I want is I want like a warm gray So a gray that that isn't like um, like super gray. It's actually got you know a little brown um, in it. So 
So these kinds of warmer grays, um, I'm trying to think of how dark I want to go for my base coat. Bastion gray and P3 is a really nice warm gray, but it's probably too dark to start with on the uh, for the white. But I think Nakar, which is what I was planning on using from a scale, I think is going to be a little too light to start with. So I will split the difference a little bit. We'll start with in the car, I'm going to add just a little bit of a little bit of the bastion gray to that. Not too much. Sorry if my uh, audio went out a little bit there. I didn't move my mic back. All right, so I'm just going to base coat her shirt. Anything you guys want to know about? Any stories you want me to tell? I feel like I'm being boring today with, with, my, with my painting. Why are you gorilla with the brush? Um, so I've talked about this a couple times on the streams. I'm happy to tell the story again. Um, so I apologize for the people who have heard it before. Um, I rebranded myself a rebranded myself the beginning. I think the beginning of last year. It's been roughly about a year, and I had. I've been known in various circles in painting with various amounts of notoriety over the years. Uh, when I first started painting, and as I got better, I started competing in different painting competitions and stuff, started winning some awards. Um, you know, people knew me in the GW circles. I was published in White Dwarf several times. Um, I had I had my stuff appearing in the GW annual catalogs. And, you know, people recognized me not necessarily by my name. Because, you know, how often do you really remember people if you are like, you know, you're looking through pictures of stuff and you might see the person's name, but you just remember the pictures of the models. People didn't really necessarily remember me by name, but they knew my stuff. Like somebody would be introduced to me and then they go, oh, he's the guy who did that flying dark elf dragon. And I go, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. 
is, you know, moderately well known for, for my painting in GW circles back in the day. And then uh, I kind of stopped competing in things. I mostly just did commission painting for a while. That was probably from around like 2004 to 2000. Um, I want to say 2008 or 2009, something like that. Um, I was mostly just doing commission painting, so I wasn't really. I kind of dropped out of the the circles of being known for my painting. Um, then I started, and I and I wasn't playing the game any the games anymore. You know, back when I first started painting, I was playing Warhammer. I was playing Warhammer 40k. Uh, I was active in going to game stores and going to conventions and things like that. But I really stopped doing that around 2004, 2000, yeah, around 2004. Mostly because we moved, at the time, the, the housing market in the Phoenix area was crazy in terms of how quickly prices were rising. And my wife and I got married and you know weren't making tons of money and we couldn't really afford houses more into town, so we moved way the heck out in the boonies where we could afford to live. And it was so far away from any of the game stores that I just kind of didn't bother going to them. So I was just doing commission painting. And um, around 2008 or so, um, we moved back a little bit further back into town and at that point then I was only about half an hour away from a game store. So I could start going more often. I got back into playing, painted some of my own stuff again. I'm still doing a little bit of commission work, but just mostly just painting my own stuff as I wanted to. Then in, I want to say 2011, 2012, somewhere around there, I was introduced to War Machine. And I loved that game and got really, really into it. I, I played Troll Bloods at the time. And so I decided to start making my internet presence a little bit bigger again. I, I went on the, the Privateer Press forums a lot. I, I made my handle Arizona Troll because I started the, with Troll Bloods. And... started posting my pictures there and became got pretty well known as you know one of the top troll bloods players in the world into or painters in the world um, I think my my forum thread where I would post all my troll bloods pictures before the mark three came out and they trashed all their forums had something like hundred and thirty thousand views and if you know different places I would go people would recognize recognize my name, you know, my, my handle, and they would recognize my paint, paint stuff. So I, I, be, I was pretty well known in the privateer press community, the war machine community. In fact, my, I had a buddy who moved to Ohio for a while. And he went to the game store there and they were asking him where he was from. And he said, oh, I'm from Arizona. And there was a bunch of troll players at that store. And they're like, oh, do you know Arizona Troll? And we're grilling him, and he's like, yeah, I've actually known him for years. Um, and they were just falling all over themselves because this guy knew me. It sounds very braggy, but just giving you a, <laughs> a perspective. Um, but eventually, as, as things do, I got kind of tired of the game. I decided to stop playing it. And so for those reasons, and I didn't really necessarily want my my handle to be tied to any game or anything like that. So I kind of wanted to have something that was just me. I could paint any models I want. People could come find me for the art and not just for the, the army that I play or paint. And I was trying to think of a handle 
to go by that would be memorable that I could end up creating a logo that was kind of fun because uh, what I wanted was something that when people would see the pictures that I would would post I could put if I could put a little logo or a little name or something on them that was memorable then each time people saw my work you know they'd associate it with this kind of brand as opposed to if I just put you know like copyright Alan O'Brien or something like that they wouldn't really start grouping the the models together they wouldn't really associate because people don't tend to is that people don't tend to remember names um, and I just my brain just popped to as Heath said Coco the gorilla you know that the gorilla that they taught sign language to and gave paintbrushes and so there's lots of pictures of Coco painting very badly but she's a gorilla what do you expect um, but she seemed to enjoy it and I thought it was kind of a funny image of this gorilla sitting there painting model miniatures it's a little self-deprecating I thought it was funny it just immediately brought a smile to my face so I went with it and eventually found a guy to to draw the the logo for me and so now that's that's kind of my thing um, I hope that I hope other th people think it's funny and, and brings a smile to their face uh, it's just a funny image to me if I ever make a mistake on something I mean what do you expect he's a gorilla right Well, I'm glad you asked. It's I gave you the long version of the story because, you know, I got to keep you guys entertained somehow. I could have just as uh, as he said, I could just said, "Oh, from Coco the Gorilla." But then it's like, "Next question, please." You know, one of the a funny story with my troll bloods army that I had so I went to a major convention one time and I had intended, so they had a bunch of events. They had um, like team, they had casual play, like open, you just meet up with somebody and play. They had um, team tournaments. They had this individual steamroller that was like, you know, a big multi-day tournament. And I wasn't really, I'm not a big tournament guy. Like I don't play the games for those reasons. So I generally don't love to play in tournaments. Um, but I went that weekend with the full intention of playing more events than, than I did. Um, but I got to that first day and I played, I was playing in just the open play area on the day that the convention started and people was, um, people were, people was, people were coming around and just happening to see. And then of course, recognizing my models and wanting to talk to me. And then, um, you know, people from privateer press were seeing my things and kind of, tweeting pictures of them. Um, the guy who was running all the events who I had met before, but I don't know if he remembered meeting me before, but, um, you know, he was, he was looking really close at my stuff and was, you know, crazy impressed. And then that first, the evening of the first day of the convention was the team tournament. And this was around the time when I was, I was getting tired of, a little bit tired of playing the game. I was, I was a little frustrated with some of the aspects of the game that had been wearing on me for a while. So, I was kind of thinking about winding down anyway, but I had kind of a bad experience in that team tournament that night and sort of decided that I wasn't going to play in any more events the rest of the weekend. And usually they award best painted out of the, the steamroller, you know, the, made, the main tournament that happens, which wasn't starting until the next day. And I didn't even unpack my... I didn't even unpack my army the rest of the weekend. Um, the second day of the tournament, you know, my buddy had brought a few board games. We just went over and sat in the open play area and ended up playing board games. We just kind of hung out with some people. Um, 
on Saturday, Saturday night, we went to um, Yard House and we were just like hanging out, having a couple beers, just relaxing. And I got a text from somebody in the main hall who said, hey, I think you just won Master Craftsman. And I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't even enter the tournament. And he goes, I don't know, they announced your name. So I tracked, I, I got a hold through Facebook of the guy who was running all the events. And I was like, hey, did, did I win an award today? He's like, you're the guy with the green troll bloods, right? I said, yeah. He's like, oh yeah, you won Master Craftsman, hands down. It's like, okay. And he goes, just you know, track me down tomorrow morning and I'll give you the award. <laughs> and so that that was a big joke among all my friends for a while that you know my painting was so good that it could win painting awards just being in its case in a hotel room in the same uh, location as the convention. They didn't even have to actually compete. So you know, I, I did I did feel a little guilty in case the the guy thought that I actually participated in the tournament and that it was only supposed to be for people that were in the steamroller tournament. But he said, no, it was for the whole weekend. But it was really funny when it happened because, um, like, again, I felt like I won without even actually entering, which was a funny, a funny occurrence. One of my friends who was at that convention with me still brings it up all the time when he wants to sort of comment on my painting. So while I was talking, uh, I guess I mixed up the next color and didn't really mix it, mention anything. So I'm doing this this white shirt of hers. Um, I used I didn't want it to be super stark white because I don't want it to look like a clean white t-shirt. So I mixed a little bit of that the previous warm gray color into my white just to knock down the the brightness of it a little bit. I'll end up going over and doing some glazing and shading later to make sure that. It doesn't look like a bright new t-shirt. I may even do a little bit of, you know, making a little dirty or mucking it up some. You could put some blood splatter on it or something later. Depends how clean I want the final model to look. I'm leaving the, the areas that are gonna be the most shadowed. I'm not going all the way into those with the white paint. do I play now? Um, I don't play anything now, actually. Over the years, I started off um, playing Warhammer Fantasy. That was the first, well, let me go back even further. My first introduction to miniature gaming was through Hero Quest, which was the, the board game where those miniatures were from that I showed you the first things I ever painted, which is kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons dungeon crawl 
but built made into a board game. And it was supposed to be, and it served well to be, to introduce kind of younger um, people into the hobby. It was a, a joint venture of Milton Bradley and Games Workshop. And at least in, in terms of, for me, it certainly did its job. Um, you know, I, I loved, as soon as I saw that game, it really intrigued me in terms of how cool the miniatures were and, you know, the gameplay with wizards and knights and all sorts of stuff in it. It was really cool. So that was my introduction. It was a few years later that I started playing Warhammer Fantasy, you know, collecting larger scale stuff. Um, I started off with High Elves. That was my first army. And I started playing with my brother. I mean, we would go to the game store, but he was the, the main guy I would play with. He played Chaos. Uh, from there, I, you know, a couple years of playing that, and I ended up branching off and also playing some 40K. I started off uh, with orcs, um, but I never single painted a. Uh, oh, see you, Mr. Heath. Uh, yeah, I should be there on on um, Josh's stream on Monday. Probably not actually streaming yet. We're still trying to figure out how to get my audio onto the stream when we stream together. But I should be in the chat room on Monday. So I'll see you then. Thanks for showing up, Mr. Heath. Um, so I was playing orcs. And I always loved, I loved orcs. You know, the aesthetic that GW had. I always wanted an orc army in fantasy. But never ended up collecting it. So when I started in 40k, I started with orcs. The problem with with orcs is, as much as I loved the aesthetic, there are like a bajillion models in an orc army. And by the time I got into 40k, I was getting pretty good at painting, but also really taking my time. And I just knew that there was no way in heck I would ever get a fully painted orc army. Just way too many models. So I never even started painting them. And eventually I sold the orc army and used the money to buy a thousand sons army because that was a really low model count army that that I thought I had a reasonable chance of actually painting. Which, although it took me I think about eight years, I did finally have a fully painted thousand sons army which I subsequently sold also. Um, after that, I dabbled a little bit in Mordheim over the years and some of those specialist games. Um, like I said, I played War Machine, Hordes, I was Trollbloods, and in fact, if you go look at my Trollbloods army, the reason that I painted them green was because they were my surrogate orc army. So they were serving as the orc army I always wanted and wanted to paint, but never did. So that's why I ended up painting those green. Uh, I played some Malifaux for a little bit, but the thing that, that I struggled with with Malifaux, it was a really, it has a lot of cool um, things to it. Like I like the, the card mechanic instead of the dice mechanic, because it creates interesting ways that all the probability distribution and things go for spiking but it was my, I was playing War Machine at the time. I was also playing a little 40K. So it was my third game. And I just couldn't wrap my head around the rules enough to have them all memorized and know what all my models did. And so my, the games I would play Malfa would last forever because I was constantly just checking everything. And I, I just realized I couldn't play that many games at one time. I couldn't keep all their rules straight, so. I stopped playing Malifaux pretty quickly. And then when I quit um, War Machine, there just wasn't really anything that drew my, my attention. Um, 
I kind of have always had ebbs and flows of my enjoyment of playing the games versus painting. You know, I'd have periods of time where I really was into going to the store and breaking out the models and actually playing the games. And I would have periods of time where I really didn't care whether I went and played or not. I just wanted to paint. Kind of ebbed and flowed over time, but they would always be the give and take. But after I quit War Machine, I, the desire to play has actually just never come back. It's just not any games that have called to me. Closest was Guild Ball, and I did do a couple demo games. I, I, I really like the uh, aesthetics of some of the models there. And I painted up a fisherman team, but after doing a few demo games, I don't know, I just didn't really, just didn't really want to play. So I ended up just selling the fisherman, mo fisherman army that I painted. Do you play anything right now? D&D home crew. That's cool. Um, yeah, I didn't really talk. I, I have done RPGs over the years. Uh, one of these days, maybe when I have more time, uh, I'll get into the systems I like to play and some of the stuff like that. Um, I didn't really... I, I always have a, a thing in my, my brain that separates the role-playing games from the tabletop games. Um, I mean, they're kind of I've always done RPGs and wouldn't mind getting another group together soon, but all the people that I know who like to play RPGs don't really like to be the GM or the DM. So that usually falls to me and right now I just don't have time to create the kind of campaigns that I like to run. And I don't really like to, to go halfway with anything. So someday when I have a little more time and to devote to writing more adventures, get some buddies together and do some more RPGs. I've also done a lot where I've, as you said, I've painted, uh, I've painted a lot of miniatures for my players over the years. Kind of depends on the particular group I assemble, whether they are more from the RPG and video gaming side of things, where they aren't, they don't really have a history of assembling and painting miniatures in their hobby. And so with those guys, I'll just, I'll get the minis and I'll paint them for them and then when the campaign's over I just keep the, the miniatures but if it's more from the miniature gaming side of things who form my play group then what I do is I encourage them to well I tell them they have to have their own mini 
and then I give them bonus experience to start, or I give them bonus experience whenever they finish painting their miniature. So if they can get their miniature painted earlier, they get some bonus experience to start jumpstarting their character. So we're making some decent progress here. So this is where we stand right now. Um, getting to the end of the two hours, so that's probably where I'll stop. Um, I'll pick up next time. We'll do some some shading on the the t-shirt. I might just do a a little bit of of touch up as soon as the the stream is over on some of these lines. But um, yeah, we'll go in and we'll shade and we'll do just a, a little bit more highlighting, starting on our shirt next time.
Anything from uh, chat before we go? We'll give you a minute because I know there's a delay. Thanks, Crystal. I'm really happy that you stopped by, and thanks for chatting with me. Um, hopefully, I get to see you on a future stream. I plan to try to uh, try to do this Sunday afternoon thing. Um, it seems to be a pretty good time for me that usually works. Um, I may sneak in an occasional midweek stream, but those are a little bit harder for me to plan ahead um, with work and with other things, and just how quickly I can get everything set up on an evening. But um, but yeah, I had fun today. Hope you guys learned something, and we'll see you next time, okay? Thanks.